Well, hello and welcome to the Small Business Association of Michigan Small Business Briefing, the Thursday edition. On uh, Monday, it was really something you could bear, I was backlit because it's such a nice day out today, uh, rainy and um, not backlit, so I guess that's good. Um, now I'm gonna be uh, joined today by Sarah Miller on our team that uh, because Rob Fowler is uh, is off, he's working. He doesn't have the day off, but uh, but not joining us on our uh, on our briefing today. So Sarah, welcome back. You have become kind of a familiar face for our briefing. Yes, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Um, but more importantly, I am excited to welcome our new member of the week, the Dada Corporation. They're located in Troy, Michigan. Uh, Sujit Dada is the owner, and the business is actually comprised of several uh, franchise restaurant locations, and he has over 211 employees and has been in business since 1992. And of course, we are pleased to welcome the Dada Corporation on behalf of our sponsor, Marana Group, um, a data document and distribution company located in Kalamazoo. So welcome the Dada Corporation. All right, very good. Yeah, just kind of a new feature. We have a, a sponsor for the Small Business Briefing and, and David Roy is past chair of the Small Business Association of Michigan said he'd like to feature uh, feature a new member of SBM on uh, on Thursdays rather than uh, talking about his company. And it's just the type of guy he is. So thank you, David, for that. Uh, we have a special guest today, been on our briefing before, and um, and, it, and we want to talk a little bit about and, and uh, get some information about inflation. We've been talking about inflation over the last uh, several months as we've been hearing a lot of feedback from members, especially in certain industries that are dealing with uh, supply chain dis disruptions and rising costs at levels that they really hadn't seen uh, while they were, while they've been in business before. So I have with us today, Gabe Ehrlich, with, with, who is an economic forecaster for, uh, for the University of Michigan. And um, Gabe, thank you for, for joining us. Now, yeah, I, just because you, you know, you're not like a high profile uh, person that people would necessarily know how big of a deal you are. So I'm just gonna go ahead and explain it. Um, there are a handful of people that are economists that are involved in doing the revenue estimating that finds its way into the consensus revenue uh, conference that the state bases all of its um, budgetary uh, decisions on. And Gabe is really at the heart of that. So Gabe, thanks for spending some time with us and uh, talking through some of these inflation uh, issues. Really interested to get your insight on what we are, uh, what we can expect um, maybe going forward and kind of the, the story as you see it uh, in terms of the, the current situation. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about the future. Um, we know that the future is never um, assured in terms of these things that we we're all making guesses, but we, we know that your guesses come with a lot more weight than the rest of us. So Gabe, welcome. Thanks for joining us again. Well, th thanks so much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Do you uh, see my slides? You got it. Great. Okay. Um, then I will go ahead and, and um, jump right in. I just wanted to say it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate all of the important work that you do on behalf of small businesses throughout Michigan. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's obviously a topic that's very much on our minds and in the news. Uh, what is happening to inflation? Uh, it used to be that we would show one slide about inflation in, in our slideshows, and that would be, you know, the time people would check their email, get a, get a drink of water. Um, and now it's what, you know, it's all people want to talk about. So what I was going to do is, is talk about inflation, but also connect it to what's happening in the labor market. So wages um, and turnover in the labor market and try to give you a, a little bit of, of um, you know, the full picture of, of what's happening right now. So I will go ahead and um, jump right to, to my graphs. And I'll just start with the headline. This graph shows you uh, all item or headline consumer price inflation in the blue line. This is year over year inflation. So, so the percent change in prices from a year ago. Um, and then I have so-called core inflation in the yellow line. So that strips out food and energy prices. Um, and uh, headline year-over-year -year inflation rose to 5.4% uh, in September. And you can see that the recent inflation uh, that we've been seeing is really the highest uh, or fastest pace of inflation since July of 2008. Um, and something that's different now, when you, when you look back to 2008, you saw big increases in headline inflation, but so-called core inflation, again, which strips out food and energy prices, 
uh, wasn't really rising that much back then. Um, a lot of the price increases we saw back in 2008 uh, really were, were from rising energy prices. Um, in, in today's environment, core inflation is also rising sharply. Um, and it came in at about 4% in the latest data. That's uh, down a bit, you can see, um, from June and July. So core inflation has ticked down just a little bit. But you can see it's still a, a much faster rate of core price inflation than we've seen in a long time. Um, and what I want to do is show you a couple of alternative measures of inflation um, to give you a sense of, you know, is this a broad-based economy-wide phenomenon or is it concentrated in particular parts of the economy? And so the first measure I'm going to show you is the median CPI measure from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, and the idea behind this measure is that using a median rather than a mean inflation rate should reduce the influence of outliers. Uh, from prices for products and services that are experiencing large price swings that might be you know, driven by idiosyncratic factors, uh, particular supply chain shortages that we might expect to, to fade you know, in the near future. Um, and so what you can see here is when you throw out those large price swings, uh, price inflation isn't really uh, much out of line with what we've seen in, in the past few years. And of course, I think uh, something you might ask, and I think with some justice is, well, do we really want to be throwing out big price changes? After all, those are real goods and services that people are truly paying for. And so I just want to say, you know, you do learn something from these alternative measures, which is that rising inflation right now, it's not a whole economy pattern yet. It is concentrated in particular parts of the economy. Um, on the other hand, this graph shows you uh, the trimmed mean CPI from the Cleveland Fed, which is similar in spirit to the median CPI, um, what it does is it throws out the highest and lowest 8% inflation rate. So, so it basically throws out about 16% um, of all of the components of the CPI and, and recalculates the CPI. And you can see by this measure, inflation actually has risen very sharply this year, right? And it's, it's, it's at its highest level in quite some time now. Um, it turns out <laughs> that the measure of inflation that the Federal Reserve targets is not actually the consumer price index. It's uh, something called the Personal Consumption Expenditures Deflator, or the PCE. Um, the PCE accounts for the fact that consumers can substi uh, substitute away from products with sharply rising prices, and it typically runs a little bit lower than CPI inflation. Um, and this is actually the inflation measure that the Fed targets at 2% per year. So that's, that's what I've got in this dark uh, horizontal line. Um, and I've plotted a few different versions of PCE inflation here, and, and they tell um, somewhat different stories. I've got the headline, so all items measure here in, in uh, the gray bar or the gray line. And you, you, know, you can see PCE does tend to follow CPI inflation, and it's picked up well above trend uh, this year. And just like we saw for uh, CPI inflation, the core, which throws out food and energy prices, uh, has also picked up. So it's this, you know, the story that we're seeing right now, it's not just about uh, these very volatile prices that we, you know, we typically say you should look past when you're thinking about the outlook for inflation. Um, that being said, if you look at the trimmed mean and the median PCE inflation measures, they have remained a, a, a lot more in line so far this year. So again, we're seeing a mixed bag from the various inflation measures that are out there um, in terms of how widespread inflation is uh, throughout the economy. So what I want to do um, now is, is look at expectations, various measures of expectations for inflation going forward. Um, this slide shows two measures of consumer expectations from the University of Michigan Survey of Consumers. Um, the green line is uh, the three-month average of, of near-term price inflation expectations. So just uh, what will prices do uh, in the next year? And then the yellow line is the five-year inflation expectations. So what will, um, what will prices do over the next five years? Um, and I think that this slide you know, does put uh, the current inflation we're seeing in some perspective. Inflation has certainly picked up in the short run and consumers expect it to remain high over the next year. But when you look you know, longer term, inflation expectations have risen, but they're not out of hand, they, um, you know, in, in the parlance that the Federal Reserve would use, they remain well anchored. Uh, the third uh, series that I've plotted on this chart uh, comes from uh, so-called treasury break-even rates. Um, 
So what they do is they, is they compare the yields on treasury inflation protected securities to non-inflation protected securities or, or so-called nominal securities. Um, and they ask, well, what would inflation need to be for an investor to break even investing in, in the inflation protected security versus the normal security? Um, and you know what, what you can see is that uh, treasury break-even inflation rates have risen quite a bit. Uh, they were running at about two and a half percent over the past few months. And, and you can see that's, that's uh, certainly higher than uh, the period before the pandemic. Um, it's not necessarily out of hand, but actually in the past week or so, so since, um, since we produced this graph, they have ticked up a little bit more to about 2.7%. So you know, if you look from the uh, financial markets, certainly investors seem to be pricing in uh, a bit more inflation than they were. It's not out of control. So I think, you know, the, really the tone, I, I guess I would strike is, you know, concerned, but not panicking. Um, this slide shows a different measure of inflation, which is the producer price index for goods. And the PPI is commonly followed as a measure of input costs for businesses. So, you know, what I've been showing you before has focused on consumer prices. This, this measure relates more to, uh, to, to input prices for, for companies. Um, the yellow line shows the PPI for processed goods for intermediate demand, and, and the blue line shows the PPI for finished goods. Um, either way, what you can see is, is that uh, input costs have really exploded recently, and they're running well above and well ahead of consumer prices. Um, so that's what's happening with prices. And what I want to do is, is switch gears now and talk for a few minutes about the labor market. And then I'll just talk briefly about what's happening with wages. And Brian, just tell me if I'm going a little long. Um, this slide compares total job openings as measured by the government uh, to the number of unemployed people. So um, job openings are in blue and the, the count of unemployed people is in yellow. And just what I want to highlight is that there are now um, more job openings than there are unemployed people. And that is a historically unusual situation. If, if you think back you know, to the Great Recession period, what you can see is there were far more unemployed people than job openings. So it is a tight labor market. Um, this slide compares quits to layoffs. And I have compressed the scale on, the, on these graphs to, to reduce uh, the distortion from the pandemic period. Um, but ho hopefully two big points come, come out of this graph. First off, uh, quits have been rising steadily this year. Uh, nearly 3% of employees quit their jobs in August. And that's actually the highest level on record for this series, which goes back uh, basically to the start of the millennia. Um, and then second, layoffs are extremely low. So if you have held on to your job during the pandemic, you face a very low risk of being laid off right now. So, so quits are high, layoffs are low. Um, and when you put these trends together, what it means is it becomes very hard to hire workers. And so what this graph shows you is the number of hires per job opening. And you can see this, this has been falling since the Great Recession. Uh, the pandemic disrupted that falling trend, but it's, it's back in force now. Um, really with a vengeance. It, it takes more job postings than ever to hire a single worker um, is, is what you can see. So it's, it's certainly not a, a figment of people's imagination. So what I want to do uh, just to wrap up is, is talk a little bit about wages. Uh, this slide shows you average hourly private earnings and they jumped during the pandemic. I do want to caution that's really about a composition effect. Um, lower wage workers are, are, are much more likely to have been laid off during the pandemic, and so that pushed up the average. But what you can see is that we haven't seen that, that reverse. And in fact, we've seen continued growth uh, from there. But uh, on this slide, what I've done is I've adjusted that average wage series for inflation. And here you can see we're really running much closer to the trend. So if you look at the pre-pandemic trend and you adjust for inflation, which as we've seen has been fast, what you can see is, is we're, we're roughly in line um, with the pre-pandemic trend now. For wages. And so Brian, I think I'm running a little bit long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip um, one of my slides, but I'm, I'm going to just show you. Um, this is a slide from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And what it does is it tracks wage growth for individual workers. So th those two slides I just showed you uh, were averages across the whole economy, and, and they really get affected by the composition of who's working. This, um, this graph really follows individual workers over time, and it shows you median wage growth. Um, for workers at different points in the wage distribution. And what you can really see here is that um, the bottom end of the wage distribution is seeing the fastest wage growth right now. So if, if you look at uh, the top three quarters of the, of the wage distribution, 
you're not really seeing um, much to write home about in terms of wage growth. But when you look at the bottom, you really are seeing an acceleration in wages. And, and I think that's part of the story um, that we're seeing. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, you know, just to summarize, inflation has accelerated sharply this year. There's a lively debate happening right now among economists um, and others about whether the current inflation is what we would call transitory or whether it's more durable. And so I'd love to talk about uh, that with you, Brian, but I do want to just plug my, my uh, unit's economic outlook conference, which will be November 18th and 19th this year. We will have um, Rob Cage, who directs the Consumer Price Index Program for the Bureau of Labor Statistics presenting. And if you Google RSQE, we should be the first people who come up. Uh, it's going to be a virtual conference again this year. Uh, attendance is free, so we'd love to have you. Great. Well, I really appreciate that, Gabe. And um, we will uh, we'll grab onto that link too and share it again as it as it uh, as it comes up because this is such a and it, it, it's a topic that it's really important for managing business and managing business at a time of supply chain disruptions and uh, and rising costs has been particularly challenging. You know, it struck me that the last time we saw an, an, uh, inflation at this type of level it was before when they're really we had the opposite problem uh, in terms of the, uh, the the workforce. There were more jobs than, or more people than uh, than jobs available. And this time, it's different. So maybe, could you maybe compare and contrast why we have inflation that looks like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, but the workforce looks literally opposite. Yeah, I, Brian, I think it, you know it's a really important question. Of course, the pandemic is a, is a very different experience than you know, just before the Great Recession and then the Great Recession period, you know, a lot of the inflation we saw leading into the Great Recession, it was really about oil prices. You know, it's it's, um, it's hard to remember now, but oil prices actually rose very sharply um, just before the recession. And that pushed up overall inflation um, well above the core. And that's part of the reason I wanted to draw that distinction between core inflation and, and the headline measure. Um, you know, now, I think that there's it's it's a really important question is is it demand inflation that we're seeing now is it supply side inflation I think the answer is it's some of both um, certainly there are, are particular sectors of the economy that have been sharply impacted you know you, you hear about the supply chain disruption certainly here in Michigan we see it in the auto industry with the microchip shortage um, you know earlier in the year we saw lumber prices take off. Um, and so these these rolling supply chain disruptions, you know, um, have certainly gone on longer than we expected. Um, so so certainly a lot of the inflation we've seen this year has been what you might think of as directly pandemic affected inflation. And that's true in the labor market. Um, you know, I personally believe a, a lot of the labor force shortfall that we're still seeing does tie back ultimately to the pandemic. Um, at the same time, I, I do have to admit the you know high inflation has gone on longer than we expected at the beginning of the year, and you do have to start to wonder you know is some of this um, a demand story? So so that's you know what we're actively assessing right now, and I'm, I'm quite confident they're assessing it at the Fed as well. Yeah, anecdotally, I think that there's something to that. I mean, as we as we hear about um, you know there's there is growing demand in some cases more demand than what. For certain things that, than what our entrepreneur members ha have experienced in the past, but at the same time, an inability to uh, to respond to that demand, and I think that's one of the the, the main frustrations out there is like you know, there's an old saying, "Make hay when the sun shines," and it just seems like it's really difficult now to um, to take full advantage in a lot of different industries and and um, and what's out there. I w wonder if we could maybe. Uh, this could be our um, our final or our wrap up. As we look toward the future, knowing that you know the, this debate on whether this is shorter term or longer term um, that'll get settled one way or another here in the coming months. But uh, in terms of the levers and monetary policy, you know we've been at, at close to zero uh, interest rates for a long time. Um, and but in, in terms of uh, in terms of the decisions that the Federal Reserve could make. Um, you know, sometimes you know inflation is, is up, and one of those levers is uh, is increasing interest rates. Any any insight there you could provide on what to expect? Yeah, th thanks, Brian. So I think you know the first thing before we see interest rates rising, we'll see the Federal Reserve taper its quantitative easing program. So they're currently uh, purchasing about you know eighty billion dollars of, of uh, securities per month. Uh, you know the talk is that that uh, tapering could begin as soon as next month on on the QE. Um, 
And then we would expect rising interest rates to follow that action, uh, probably in the second half of next year. So I think, you know, the Fed is aware of this, um, but, you know, it, it really does want to take a wait and see approach. If you look back to the Great Recession, people really criticized the Fed for doing too much. I think in retrospect, they didn't do enough to get us back to a hot labor market uh, quickly, in, in, you know, in my opinion. So I think the Fed really wants to be patient if it can, uh, but the longer, you know, these price increases go on, you, you know, the harder it, it, it gets to, to really stand pat. Well, I really appreciate your, uh, your, your help and your insight, Gabe. This means a lot to us to have uh, this level of, uh, of expertise of, available to members. So appreciate your time. We'll see you on the, on the next time around. Great. Thanks, Brian. All right. Well, Sarah, we've got a, a, a handful of other things that we wanted to talk about today. There's no shortage of things that are happening. Um, we, so yes. jump right into it. Yes, we have a full slate. So we'll kind of do a little rapid fire Q&A here. So the first thing we should really talk about is that the White House is reviewing the OSHA mandate rule. So could you talk us through what's new and is there any potential timeline um, to have this new OSHA rule filed? So what the part that we don't know is how long the White House is going to review the rule for, but we do know as soon as they make a decision and give the green light that it's filed in the federal registry. And at that point, the state of Michigan, which has a Michigan Department of OSHA, uh, not all states do, about 22 states, well, 22 states, including Michigan, have a state OSHA department. They'll have 30 days to come up with a substantially similar rule. Um, it has to be at least as strict according to the, the rules and, and the authority that it's formed under the state. Um, they act essentially as an, an arm of, uh, of the uh, federal department of OSHA. And, um, and so they'll have 30 days to, um, to issue a state rule after that. Um, and then it, at that point, there would normally be some form of a, um, a lead up for when that vaccine mandate would go into effect. As we talked about last week though, uh, I do expect that there will be some, uh, some court action on that. So um, whether or not it's, it gets to a point of a stay or if it goes into effect and is challenged uh, through the court process without a stay or a pause in the effectiveness of the rule is a really big open question. But um, it's about a 30 day, when you hear that it's been, that the White House said yes and it's filed, then you should expect our state within 30 days to have a state response. Well, that's good. We'll have a little bit of time to digest the information and make sure people understand how they need to comply. So that's that's good. Um, now, speaking of stays in the courts, the Supreme Court just refused a stay request on a health care mandate. So what can we learn from that? Justice Breyer um, took a request. There was a um, it, this is a, a health care uh, case. It's a, uh, a hospital and or hospital employees in Boston that challenged uh, the denial of, uh, of an exception based on religious grounds. And, um, and so the, the local court found in favor of the health care system in that case, in other words, in favor of the health care mandate, then uh, they tried to get it stayed while it goes through from a, a panel of Court of Appeals. And um, they did not stay it. And then it went to the Supreme Court, asked them to stay this uh, decision while it works itself through the regular process. And the answer from the Supreme Court was no. So what can this tell us uh, in terms of the private sector mandate? And you, you, if you've been um, listening closely to, to how I've talked about this in the past uh, couple months, I always have kind of an asterisk on, um, you know, there's a private sector, sector mandate except for healthcare. I think on the healthcare front, you're a healthcare entity, there are a lot of different places and ways that, uh, that the regulators can point to current law and say, we have the authority or hospitals have the authority uh, for in infection control standards in the healthcare setting to do this. I think that's its own class. So what that, what that was was really more, just, or more um, confirmation of what we saw. Remember there was in Houston, a hospital that had challenged or nurses in a hospital that challenged um, a, uh, a mandate there as well and um, tried to take it all the way through to the Supreme Court and was not able to get that mandate overturned. So in the healthcare setting, not particularly surprising that the stay was not granted, not at the Court of Appeals, 
not at the um, at the Supreme Court. The case itself, though, is only in the Court of Appeals. So they just elevated up this request to say, "Don't make us comply while the court action is taking place." Um, the uh, I don't think it tells us much about the private sector mandate outside of healthcare. I think this is a brand new question, one that there's not a lot of uh, existing case law or history that we can look at to say, yep, this is how the courts usually decide on these things. This is a very unusual circumstance to take a vaccine mandate outside of the healthcare arena. All right, well, we'll have to keep an eye on that one. Um, we're talking about vaccines. There's been more news this week from the FDA around boosters. So can you fill us in on those developments? The, the um, FDA has now provided guidance approval for boosters for Johnson & Johnson and um, in Moderna. Uh, they already had done so for, um, for Pfizer, same priority populations. So these are uh, people over age 65, immune compromised, and um, those in high risk professions like healthcare. So, um, so boosters approved for all three vaccines, but the part that was um, that a lot of people were not, and that wasn't a surprise, but the part that people weren't as clear on is whether or not they would approve officially to allow mixing and matching. So if you got a first dose of Johnson & Johnson, can you get a second dose of Pfizer or a second dose uh, um, of uh, Moderna? And they said, yes. So um, I think that this, there are a couple of things at play potentially here. First is, it's all kinds of data from other countries that have been mixing and matching the whole time because they couldn't get enough vaccines in, early in the process that, um, that it's safe and effective to, to, to use two different types of vaccines for, for boosters versus uh, for shots. So I think that they had plenty of data to look at. I also think that ahead of the private sector mandate, they wanna take away any argument that anybody could have that they couldn't have ready access to uh, to vaccines. And by, um, uh, by instituting this policy, I think that they are getting ahead of one potential court argument that could come up later on in the year. Okay. All right, we're gonna switch gears now and we're gonna go to uh, Rob's favorite game, which is uh, kind of, let's tie the, the headlines together. So two headlines for you today. First is Senator Manchin considers changing parties. Number two, IRS floats a new compromise. So pull those together for us. Senator Manchin has been in the spotlight because he's the, the Democrat from West Virginia who has been, um, uh, has been holding out on supporting Biden's uh, plan, President Biden's plan for three and a half trillion dollars. And part of that plan is a, a tax increases, including this new IRS rule. The pressure and, and frankly, the tactics uh, that have been used to try and move Joe Manchin has really um, has has really um, started to uh, push push him away. He's telling, he's saying privately, been reported pretty widely um, that he has uh, considered even filing as an American independent, so not switching to a Republican, but as an independent. And um, and so what this is sending a signal that. Hey, he's not going to use that party infrastructure to run for his upcoming reelection. He's going to uh, potentially run as an independent because I think that that's one. It's one of the things that happens to moderates in our system. So Senator Manchin is a moderate, and um, and so what happens and it happens to moderate Republicans too is their own party tends to try to um, to to push him out or threaten we're going to take you out in the next primary. And he's I think sending a message that he's going to take that chip off the table. You can't use that. And, uh, but one of the things that is kind of pushing uh, the, the moderates in the system is things like uh, what is floated as a compromise for the IRS rule. And uh, so you might recall, we did a call to action against this, um, uh, where they said every bank account that has an average, that has a balance of over $600, all inflows and outflows have to be reported to the IRS. So then they floated a, a compromise and they said, well, instead of $600 gonna be $10,000, but guess what? It's $10,000 in aggregate deposits for a year. That's also most accounts. So it's not $10,000 at any given time. Their, their so-called compromise is to say, um, hey, it's $10,000 aggregate deposits over the course of a whole year. Um, so anybody with income over $10,000 is, um, is, is going to um, is going to be subject to this unless they uh, 
you know, divided that among, uh, between a bunch of different accounts. So this is a, um, an example of the sort of thing that keeps on pushing the people that are kind of occupying the middle of our political system. And, uh, and, and while it, you know, is presented as though as a compromise, it really isn't a compromise. It's something that we still adamantly, adamantly, forcefully oppose. And uh, on, the, on the ground, it doesn't matter what, they could set it at 100,000 or set it at a, at a million in terms of inflows, outflows. That's not the point. The idea of fishing expeditions and people's uh, checking accounts just to see if there's any way you can squeeze more taxes out of them is something that is not right. Right, okay, good update there. Now, Gabe did talk a little bit about unemployment numbers in his presentation, but I know that we do have some new unemployment numbers out. So thoughts, good news, bad news? So unemployment is down a little bit, ticked down the 10th of a point, so that's good. But what actually the rate, you might, you, you know, if you've been watching our briefing for a while that um, I don't think the rate is the most important thing. Um, really the size of the workforce, but also um, the, the number of people employed. You know, remember the unemployment rate has a numerator and a denominator. So sometimes the rate can go down, but for bad reasons. In this case though, um, the workforce grew by about, uh, of employed people grew by a net of about 12,000. That's not much, but it's in the right direction. So I think that the rate dropped a, a little bit, but for the right reasons. The, uh, so that makes it good news without an asterisk. Okay, so it's, it's small good news, but still good news without an asterisk. The other thing is that uh, the workforce itself, though, if you pre compare to pre-pandemic, pre the overall available workforce in our state is still down 200,000 people. So when Gabe talked about this, um, you know, this, this labor shortage, there's growth and new demand out there. And at the same time though, the workforce is still 200,000 people short of what it was pre-pandemic times. All right, I know we're running close here to our time, but one more quick question. Um, lots of headlines about redistricting. So what's going on with that process and um, what does it mean to our small business owners? So we are, let, let's plan on covering this on, on Monday because I, I think it deserves a little more time that we have for today. And nothing big is going to change between now and Monday. But the, the crux of it is that there is a, uh, all the lines are being redrawn, huge implications on who controls the House and the Senate in Michigan and, and Congress in Washington, D.C., and big, big controversy over the state rules and how they're interpreting them and the Federal Voting Rights Act. And, um, and it's causing some issues, especially in places like Detroit um, and, uh, and the number of majority minority districts. So a district that has a majority of the voters are minorities. Um, that's where this, this, these redistricting plans are really falling short and it's causing uh, some pretty big confrontations. And I think uh, increasing the likelihood or the odds that it ends up being settled in the court, what the lines are. All right, so we'll definitely cover that on Monday, so you all can tune in then. Before we go, I do want to let you know we have two upcoming webinars. One is next week, October 27th. It is Leadership Connecting with Others by Cultivating Empathy. So we'll drop the link here in the chat. And then on November 2nd, we have a familiar briefing face, uh, Jamie LaPiccolo. He will be joined by a colleague to talk about the employee retention tax credit. So um, if those are interested to, interesting to you, go ahead and register using the links. So thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your week. See you on Monday, everybody.